Praise the Lord, friends. Welcome to this teaching on how we should not be tick-talking our life away. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you have gathered us together. And you have promised us that when we gather in your name, you will be present. Lord, in your presence, there is the fullness of joy. There is the fullness of life. And Lord, as we come before you, we pray offering every single person who is participating in this retreat, that they may see your face, that they may hear your voice, that they may experience the great plan, the supreme plan that you have for their lives. Jesus, may your name be glorified through every one of us. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the three theme eight is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, where the word of God, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Dear friends, this is such a relevant theme for this time. Because I believe the world is going through such a dark phase that it has not known in several, 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 several decades. Maybe even in centuries. The kind of suffering, the kind of darkness this world is walking through. Perhaps too many of us are complaining about it. And here is where... We have the Lord calling us to be the light. Now, I'd like to begin this sharing with a, a very uh, interesting story from Greek mythology. It's about a, a very interesting character called Narcissus. Now, Narcissus um, is someone definitely most of us would have liked to see because he was supposed to be amazingly, uh, unbelievably handsome. And he was so handsome, he was a hunter, that everyone who looked at him fell in love with him. And they were, they were those who were dying because they were in love with him. And he seemed to be so arrogant and even took pleasure in the fact that those who looked at him fell in love with him and would die because of that. And it is at this point that there is this um, another Greek mythological character called Nemesis. Nemesis is a goddess of revenge. So she decides that uh, Narcissus is very vain and arrogant and he needs to be taught one good lesson. So one day when he's hunting, she, she lures him, she draws him to, draw, to drink water from a pool and that way that he may get to see his own self. Now, Narcissus doesn't know who he really is. All he knows is that he's so great and everyone who looks at him falls for him and falls and dies for him. But when he looks at his own image on the water, he falls in love with himself. I don't know if you have a brother or a sister or a friend who just can't stop looking at themselves in the mirror, can't stop taking selfies. So this guy was incredibly handsome and, and he looks at himself and the first thing is he doesn't realize it is himself. He doesn't realize that he is so stunningly handsome and, and he is smitten with himself. And as he is looking at this image of himself, Second thing is, he's not able to stop looking at himself. He's not able to eat. He's not able to drink. He's not able to do anything. He, he does feel hunger. He does feel thirst. He's a hunter. He must have had a very good appetite. But he is addicted. He's, he's like totally imprisoned by the fascinating image of himself. And thirdly, ultimately he dies. And it is said, he dies not only because he's wasting away, He's not, he's not feeding himself, but also because now he has this pain in his heart because he knows that image he sees cannot respond to him. Cannot, cannot you know, uh, satisfy his longing for this, this, this particular image. He realizes he cannot go beyond looking and admiring. He cannot fill his heart. His heart is not going to be filled with this other image because he knows somewhere it, it doesn't exist. 
And this is perhaps very reflective. Even if today we are not looking at the mirror or we are not looking at, at, at any image of, of ourselves, too many of us are spending a lot of time sucked up in that quagmire that social media can become. Social media is not bad. I believe every one of us should have a presence there. But when I am not aware of who I am, when I am not aware of, of what a, a stunning, impressive, absolutely amazing creation I am, when I do not know my self-worth, that is when I am sucked up into that social media platform that I am, that I am already participating in. I, I'm, I'm looking there, looking for someone, some way to, to fulfill myself and I'm allowing life to pass by me. Friends, every one of us, we must know we have only one life. And even if you live a hundred years, very often we think we're going to be young forever. I assure you, it's not forever. It's very fleeting. So even if you live a hundred years, you know, you and I, we would only have 36,500 days. And I tell you, that is nothing. We are people who live like we have a million days at hand. No, we don't. 36,500 days. And for you and me to live life to its fullest, we must know life is made of days and days are made of minutes. And for us to live this life, I remember in one of our first youth conferences, international youth conferences, I think it was around the year 2008, we had this uh, world tennis champion, an Indian, uh, Vijay Amrit Raj. And he had come and spoken to the youth and he said one thing that struck me. He said, if you don't know your roots, if you are not aware of your roots, you will not be able to wear a crown. And he explained, he says, if you do not know where you came from, if you have lost touch with your beginnings, you really would not know where to head to. So it's very important for us to know who we are where we've come from, what is the purpose of our existence. You know, here is where I would like to quote Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. We've had some amazing, God has really blessed us with some amazing uh, popes to lead the church in these decades. And uh, Pope Benedict XVI is a great writer, a very inspired prophetic leader. And he says, he explains, he says, you are not some casual, meaningless product of evolution. You're not like something that just happened because you had to happen. Don't ever think that, oh yeah, my parents got married or whatever, they, they, they came together and, and I was born. Definitely not. He says, you are not some casual, meaningless product of evolution. Evolution, each of us is willed by God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. And each of us is necessary. And today, you and I, we need to go back to that mirror. You need to tell yourself, I am willed by God. I am loved by God. And I am necessary for God. And then, Pope Benedict says, The world offers you comfort. But you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. You were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. And until you achieve greatness, you will realize your heart is never full. Even if you had 48 hours of the day to, to spend in social media, you would not have got an iota of life. So let's look at these these two uh, statements of Pope Benedict Emeritus, Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, we are not some casual, meaningless product of evolution. Every one of us is willed. Every one of us is loved. Every one of us is necessary. And this is exactly what Scripture says in John chapter one, verse thirteen. And and you and I need to listen to these words. These words of Jesus, where Jesus says. You were born, and it's more clear, you were born not by natural generation. Don't think you're the product of some biological process. You were born not by natural generation, 
nor by human choice, not by man's decision, but by God's decision. You were born not by natural generation, not by human choice, not by man's decision, but by God's choice, God's decision. The question is not whether our parents wanted us, planned us, we were an accident. None of these things matter. Who wants us, who doesn't want us, does not matter at all because every one of us, what really matters is that we were desired by God. We were the decision of God. St. John Paul II would say, you are a heartbeat of God. Now, if we were made for greatness, why is it that we are not able to achieve this greatness? Dear friends, if we do not know what we are living for, we will allow life to slip out of our hands. And Jesus clearly, beautifully explains this parable that I think is so relevant for every one of us, especially those of you who are starting out in life. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 13, 30, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, Jesus is talking about the parable of the talents, and I know you've heard this many times. But listen to this, because it is about you. It's not just one of the parables Jesus said. Jesus talks about a ruler, a man of power, who calls three of his servants, and he gives one five talents. He gives the second one two talents, and he gives the third one one talent. And the guy who's got five talents, he's all charged up, he feels great about himself, his master trusted him, and he goes out and because he's so sure, those talents for him were an affirmation of what his master thought of him. He goes out and he invests. He actually invests all those five talents, and by the time the master calls him back, reporting time, he comes back with five more talents. So he's got now 10, 10 talents to give back to the master and the master finds that he is really capable and sets him over much. Gives him a very high position. And it's similar with the second servant. He comes with two talents. He's, he's quite thrilled about it. He goes and invests it. He's thinking what's the best thing to do and he realizes he must invest it and he comes back with four talents and the master is really impressed with him. Gives him a high responsibility. Now the third servant, he gets one talent. What is he doing with that one talent? And I'm so sure when he got that one talent, he thought, oh, the others have five. Someone else has two. I have one. He did not think of those who had none. This ruler obviously did not have only three servants. But this man with a single talent it is said he was a timid man, a man who, who could not venture out of his fears. So what does he do? He goes and buries the talent. Have you ever wondered whether you have some talents that are buried? He goes and buries his talent and when the time of reckoning comes, he returns at one talent. And he tells the master in Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 and 25, we read, he says, Master, I know that you are a hard man. What is the difference between him and the one who had five talents? The one who had five talents knew his master and was confident about the master. He was also confident that the master was confident of him. But this man, he says, I know that you're a hard man. You reap where you do not sow. And therefore I was afraid. And I buried this talent. What was he afraid of? And the master calls him, you wicked, lazy servant, and takes away from him what he had. And here is where Jesus says, to him who has, more will be given. And to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now this seems very unfair, but look at this parable again. When I do not understand the value of my talent, I will allow it to slip away. If I did not know the value of this microphone, without this microphone, my voice will not reach so far away as where you are. 
If I did not know the value of this microphone, I wouldn't be holding it. And too many of us do not know the value of who we are. We do not understand that, that great value God has placed on our life. And that is why we allow it to tick tock away. <laughs> so here we see clearly that if you knew what God thinks of you, if you knew what God's plan for you is, you will not bury talents, you will unbury, you will discover talents and you will be a light to the world. Friends, too many of us, too many of us are complaining, are being anxious, spending time discussing negative stuff. Oh, what about my future? What's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen to this world? That's not our business. Our business is to let our light shine. The Word of God clearly says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 14, you know what God says? The Lord I know the plan I have for you. God knows the plan. None of us has been like just thrown into the world. We've not been created in a factory, mass production. Ephesians 2.10, it says we are the handy work of God. He has molded every detail of your life, your, your, your physical structure, your intelligence, your talents, your, your ancestry, the circumstances of your life. Everything has been molded by God. For what? It says you are the handiwork of God, created for great good works. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 and 9, it says what your eye has not seen and your ear has not heard, what your heart cannot desire, what your mind cannot conceive. This is what your God has prepared for you. We can't sit on the couch any longer. Isaiah chapter 55, 8 and 9, the word of God says, know this, God's plans are not your plans. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much greater is what God has planned. And that is why we cannot settle for anything less than the best. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the word of God says, God is able to do for you beyond what you can even ask or imagine. Dear friends, if my asking is at this level, it's because I'm human. But God's level is greater. His ways are higher than the heavens are above us. And that is why we need to turn to Him. We need to turn to Him and tell Him, Lord, today what you want me to do with my life. And I can assure you, God will not allow you even for one minute to waste it. I'm not saying you'll be workaholic. I'm not saying you should not even look at social media. We have to have a presence there. We have to have a defining presence over there. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, when God is saying, I know the plan I have for you, he says something. My plan is to build you up. It's for your welfare, not to break you down, not for woe. Now, you and I could have decided certain things are gone in our life. We're not good in certain things. We're not capable of, of, of living life the way it looks best to be. But God says he has only one plan. God's plan for your life is to raise you up. He says, my plan is, to give you, is, is for your welfare, not for war, to give you a future and a hope. If God has planned this much for you, what can the coronavirus do against you? What can the pandemic, the economy, or anyone else or everyone else do against you? Nobody can bring you down. If God has decided to raise you up, but there's something that is needed from our side. And God says, I have a plan for you. My plan is for your welfare, not for war, to give you a future and a hope. And then God says, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And you will find me. And you will see your life being changed. You will realize that I am with you. Listen to this. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future with a hope. And then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes. In certain other versions, it says, I will change your lot. 
your life would be transformed. You would live on another level and you will realize that all that you're doing is so much beyond what you ever dreamt of. Friends, this is true. And that is why we need to know it is in the encounter with God and coming before God and seeking to live the fullness of life. Firstly is when you come to meet God, you will find him. And until we find him, we will never know who we are because we are in the image and likeness of God. Until we find him, we will never know what is his supreme plan for us. And, and we could be trying to live out other people's plans and other people's lives and our, our you know, poorly framed plans. None of these will work. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds your house, the laborer toils in vain. Unless the Lord builds a house of your life and your future and your dreams, you will be doing a hundred different things and not getting anywhere. It is when we look at God, when we wait in prayer, that we truly will come to know who we are. Unlike Narcissus, who did not really know who he was. And then we see the great promise that when we wait in prayer, we shall be anointed with the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, I'm just reading one verse. Verse 17, it says, In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The prophesy means your word will carry power. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. It's not just men, but your young and your old will have a vision. You will know where you are headed to. Otherwise, you are just like this fabulous vehicle with a great GPS system and having no destination to go. Or like that joke about a man in the coffin, all dressed up and nowhere to go. If I do not know my destination, I could be living a dead life. And that is why we need to come before God. And we need to know this life is what God has given me. In this life, there is a plan, a plan that has to be worked out day after day, week after week. Moment by moment. When you encounter God, if at this moment you can tell God, God, I want to know you. You gave me this life. I want to live it. And I want to live it according to your supreme plan because there can't be anything better than that. And I want the best for my life. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Show me the way. And Jesus, who is the way, the truth and the life, will lead you. Friends, I'd like to share with you a beautiful testimony of one of my uh, youth friends comes and volunteers here every year. His name is Steve. So Steve, when he first walked into this campus, he was really a failure in life. He was studying his engineering. And at that point of time, he has 27 areas. 27 papers to clear. And in, in the next one year, if he doesn't clear it, he loses his degree. Suddenly hit him that, you know, he was being unjust to his parents. He loved his parents. And he realized he has no future. He just couldn't see it in him to do anything good in life. He thought, all my life, I, this is what I've been. And I, I somehow was pushed into engineering. And these three years, I've, I've had all the fun in life. And... And I really can't see myself as being different, as accomplishing anything in life. And he realizes that he's, he's, he started his life as a failure. He's not able to see a future. He's slipping into depression. And that is when, you know, he, he comes here for a retreat. He just walks into the Divine Retreat Center campus. It so happens that that week was a youth retreat. And when he walked in, he saw this huge banner. The theme of the retreat that week, that week was from Romans 8, 37, where the word of God says, you are more than conquerors. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. 
And when he read it, he said, I feel like failure, defeated, nothing left in life, no excuse, no hope. I just don't know how to face my people. I just don't have a future to look to. And here it says, you are more than a conqueror. Somehow that word touched him. During the retreat, he was praising God. He was giving himself 100%. He was listening to the word of God. And he realized, God has a plan for me. And that plan is, does not destine me for failure. That plan is to raise me up. As scripture says, far above what I ever wanted for myself. Far above even what my parents or anyone else in the world wanted for me. He prayed, was, had a beautiful experience of the Holy Spirit. He goes back to the country where he came from, wrote his exams, and he cleared everything. And he comes here every year only to praise and thank God. Because what God has accomplished in his life is fabulous. He says, today I am more than a conqueror in Christ. Friends, this is the testimony that every one of us have a right to say. Every one of us, as Jesus invites us, we should be a light. You are the light of the world. And this world needs that ray of hope that your life has to give. You are willed by God. You are loved by God. You are necessary. Necessary for God's plan of making this world a better place. Friends, I invite you to close your eyes at this moment. After this teaching, towards the end of this session, you will have a challenge. A time when God is not going to test us and fail us, but where we're going to really come to understand who we are. I want to tell God, God, I want to thank you for this life. Lord, I try to find the meaning of my life in how people could appreciate me. I was constantly presenting myself trying to impress others. Lord, while I shed tears and felt low about myself, in the shadow of my room, well, Lord, I try to present myself as a winner. Oh God, I kept looking to see how many would accept me. And yet I know, oh God, everything there on that that circle of friends in my virtual life was unreal. As unreal as the virtual world is. God, today as I come before you, I pray, reveal to me, Lord, your plan for my life. Reveal to me, Lord, that in every minute of my life, this plan has to be fulfilled. Oh God, I pray, Use me as a light that I can give hope to those who are in distress. That I can give wisdom to those who are lost. That I can bring joy to those who are sad. That indeed, O oh God, those who look at my life will see your hand is with me. Amen. Friends, so I pray you have a very, very blessed uh, retreat session. Uh, may God bless you and may God raise you up. Allow him to raise you up so that you can do wonderful things for God and especially for those who are suffering. God bless you and don't forget to take up that challenge, that challenge at the end of this session.